Hello, and welcome to Inside Influence, the show where we talk to B2B marketing insiders about what's working and what's not inside the world of B2B influencer marketing. Of course, my name is Lee Oden, CEO and co-founder of Top Rank Marketing. And today we're talking with the OG of B2B when it comes to influencer marketing at SAP. Of course, I'm talking about none other than in, uh, <laughs> influencer marketing and communications vice president at SAP, Amisha Gandhi. Welcome, Amisha. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. It's great to see you again. Um, so let's get started. Now, you know, as much as anyone, the impact that the pandemic has had on individual people's lives as well as on business. What do you think the impact has been when it comes to influencer marketing in the B2B world? So I think definitely people are looking at their entire customer journey is now completely digital. So I think you see increase in digital social selling. You see increase in digital demand gen. If it wasn't already, it was going that way anyways, and it was majority, now it's made that shift. Um, people are looking at creating more engaging online experiences, virtual. Um, I think people are a little zoomed out at this point, but I think at the beginning, they were really looking to get and go, everybody had to go 100% digital overnight. And I think that just create, create a really great opportunity for influencer marketing when you think about the customer journey, because we're really trying to create conversations and engagement, and now everything has to be done virtually, right? So even your live experiences with your influencers, customers, employees, everyone has to be online. I think it just creates that opportunity for us to work with influencers to manage and make those experiences as valuable as possible. Great. Now, I mentioned, of course, the OG reference. So you've been working with influencer marketing for a long time and you pioneered the influencer marketing effort at SAP. How did you first get involved uh, working with influencers in your career? So in my career, you know, I think when I look back, you know, always have been in marketing and public relations um, and some advertising, always seeing that, working with whether it's press or analysts or others, you know, working and customers, especially um, how much influence they have on a sales cycle. And this is on the B2C side as well as the B2B side. And when you think about B2B, our sales journey is just different. And so prior to joining SAP, I've been working on blogger relations with com other companies um, and in B2B really seeing how those bloggers reviews and other things could really and commentary could help in the sales cycle. And I did a lot of affiliate programs. So that gave me the idea of, Hey, you could actually move product. You can move thought leadership with the right people in the right campaigns. And that idea stuck with me. And as I worked my way through my SAP career, there was an opportunity when I was doing mobile product marketing to create a broadcast booth at the show. And I said, well, instead of doing and having just SAP people and SAP customers, let's bring in some thought leaders for like from Laptop Magazine, Ray Wong from Constellation, people that don't normally talk to us during Mobile World Congress at this mobile show, have them come and help us co-create our content. And that content did really well in our marketing campaigns and our website to the tune that we did it the following year. And I thought, well, this could be a thing. Could it be more than just the videos? Could it be eBooks? Could it be everything that we're doing, but just injecting this kind of different thought leadership in and influence in? And that's where I got the idea. And then I kind of pitched the idea around and then it became a thing. And then they said, okay, here you go, but you know, find out if this actually works. And I started on with the global demand gen team, not with events or with social, but that's the team that this was put on. Um, so that gave it a different viewpoint, I think, right from the beginning, that it was marketing versus influencer relations. Got it. So let's fast forward and to, let's say, 2021. Um, what do you think some of the biggest changes will have been, or what do you think will be changed in the next year, post-pandemic, hopefully, uh, when it comes to influencer marketing for B2B? I think that there's not, it's never going to go back to the new normal. I think there's this new normal that everybody keeps talking about. I think there is going to be a more impetus for people. I don't think we're going to see events come back in the same way. I think people are going to be a lot more judicious about that. I think people are very event happy. Um, I think people are also very content happy as well. So I think 
we're going to start seeing a little bit more focus on what people, you know, should be putting out there, how they're co-creating with influencers, where they're bringing influencers in. I think, you know, bringing influencers into ABM, into lead gen, into advocacy. I think employee advocacy and customer advocacy and community is going, is having a resurgence of the sense of community right now is having a resurgence. You're going to see more of that content, more deeper funnel, I think, with influencers. But then you're also going to think and see a lot of a rise in employee advocacy and customer advocacy as plays and those things more brought together. Um, and I think of it more as influence marketing versus influencer marketing because you have right. your external influencers, customers, employees, and other kinds of advocates. Sure. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, how expressions evolve and what we really mean is, yeah, the notion of how we can leverage influence, build influence uh, and leverage influence to be persuasive, uh, to build confidence, to build trust, uh, lower sales cycles and achieve all those other wonderful things that we like to set out to do with marketing and sales and, and even PR. So, um, of course, you're familiar. Uh, we did some research on the topic. Um, and we published a report called the 2020 State of B2B Influencer Marketing Report, uh, which you contributed to. And we found in that report and that research that B2B marketers are engaging influencers for content that, that does everything from build brand awareness to help generate leads. And I'm just curious, do you view influencer marketing as something that you apply to specific objectives or can it be used more broadly or, or both? I think both. It depends on what you're trying to do. I think, you know, something that we always talk about and we agree on is that influencer marketing, when you're creating, it should be an ongoing relationship. So it's almost like you want to create a community of influencers around your business, or if you're a large place like SAP around the topic that you're really trying to influence and the persona that you're trying to influence. Um, and you really want to think about that long-term, right? A aspect of it. And then as you're, you know, in, in your research, as you're talking about, um, you know, these, these influencers can really help you broadly, but they can also help you and think about every step of the customer journey. And we break it down. We have certain things that we do within those. Think of how you can influ infuse influencers into those motions all the way across. So then when you do a campaign, you have influencers right from awareness all the way down to advocacy. You know, I'm glad you brought up that, that idea of ongoing influencer engagement because this is something that we found in our research. Uh, 12 times more companies who are running ongoing programs stated that they were very successful versus those who are only doing uh, periodic campaigns. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting gap, really, uh, or the difference between what it takes to build a community and the return you get on that long view versus... Um, just w working with or using, as some people say, influencers to help promote some content. Yeah, I wouldn't say use influencers, right? I always say right. work with influencers. And I'm not surprised at all, you know, when the research came out and I was looking at it, it's not surprising that there is more benefit because when you have a long-term relationship and you're creating a community of influencers, they're going to be engaged with you and your brand even if there's not a current campaign happening, if they really like being part of your campaign, they may be showing that they're all speaking, they're talking to other people. They're going to talk about their experience with you longer term as well. It's not just for that moment. I think if you're very transactional, that's what you're going to end up with. And I don't think whether B2B to B2C, right? I don't think that helps anyone. I think especially in B2B, it's a long haul and the better that you can bring this community and make them feel like they're part of a community. They're not part of your company. They're part of this community. Yeah. Then I think the benefits for the influencers and for the company is, is better. Yeah. Feeling special is a really big part of the, the influencer experience, right? There's, there's a, there's a saying I love to use. If they don't care, they won't share, you know, and that's right. part of what we're looking for. Right. Um, You've said many times, and we've talked about this before, that effective influencer marketing is really about, or one of the things that it's about is about mutual value creation. Can you talk a little more about that, what you mean by that? Sure. I mean, there are influencers. So there are some influencers who are influencers and that's their business, right? But I think there are a lot of influencers, especially in B2B, who are developers, who are actual implementers of technology, 
or they're actually I've done the work or held the position of CIO, CFO, or some sort of influence, right? And some of them have written books, some of them are academics, it depends, but they have some sort of inspirational guidance out there, right? That people follow them for a reason. And so when you're working with folks like that, it's not always the contract that's the value for them as well. It could be, you know, we have a large ecosystem, partner ecosystem at SAP. Some of our influencers are also partners and, and you know, some of the partner organizations. So they like to come and do business with us. So we're making introductions into our ecosystem on behalf of the influencer. And they're actually doing business with us or with our partners, you know, so we're actually building business together, right? Oftentimes. And that's not to say that they're out there endorsing SAP, but they're a little bit more involved, right? And so they are getting that intrinsic value. For other folks, there is the contract. But again, if you have a long-term relationship, it, does, it becomes less about the contract and the work. If you're asking people to do a keynote, if you're asking them to write long articles or to do thought leadership, you're paying right. them for work. You're not paying them to endorse. I'm not paying them to endorse SAP. I'm right. paying them because they've interviewed 10 customers and they're writing a really thorough piece of content and that's their job, right? And that's based on their knowledge. So mm -hmm. it depends. There are influencers we don't pay at all. There are influencers we pay some for certain activities and others not, right? So if we're asking for a quote in an ebook and take somebody a couple of minutes because they're a really great thought leader and just take them that much time, they're, they're involved in that way because they're offering their thought leadership. And then the longer pieces of content of the keynote we pay for, because again, you don't want to take people for granted either. So you want to create that relationship, but there is that mutual benefit of building business together and asking your influencers, what do you want out of the relationship, right? And with size of contract, right? And really getting to know them and really saying, how can we help you beyond just this? And I think it works both ways because they'll come back and ask you the same thing and you're going to get this amazing value both ways. Yeah. The foundation of a great relationship. Um, so this is something that's interesting that pops up still. Like there's been a lot of growth in the field of B, you know, influencer marketing for B2B companies. Um, it, it's certainly not um, at the level some other tactics or strategies are at, but it has experienced quite a bit of growth. And um, while it's been around, there's, there are still marketing executives who think about influencer marketing through a B2C lens. I'm just curious what you would say are the big differences between B2C and B2B influence marketing? So I really think B2C, and this is a great question because I think a lot of people want to start off and think of influencer marketing as a tactic. And if you think about it more as a strategy, it's going to have better impact on your business, especially on the B2B side. In B2C, when you think about influencers, yeah, you have the quasi celebrity, people have large followings. You want to make sure it's not fraudulent. They, they get a lot of conversations going. The platforms are different. There's TikTok. There's a new one called Triller. I don't know how it's doing, but you know, there's Twitter, it's, it's much more consumer facing and there's everyday people. So they don't have to be an expert in your company or a topic, but it's more the everyday person, right? That has built some sort of audience. Um, and so it could be my mom, it could be my sister, you know, it could be many different people depending on what their passion is, personal passion is, right? When you look on the B2B side, you may, it's going to be more professional based. The platforms are different. It's Twitter and LinkedIn and, you know, other things like YouTube, right? And video and, and things where we're looking to engage our customers. It's a, if industry events, other places and, and, and things where we're going to show up online communities, you know, that also works for both. But again, it's more of a professional person. It's someone who's written a book, you know, it's someone who has developed some sort of following. Their following is probably going to be a lot less on the B2B side than the B2C side. But again, it's not about numbers. We even have influencers in our B2B program that have no social media following at all, but they are really important in their industry or to that persona. And they're, they built their influence somewhere else outside the social media realm. So I think that's some of the big differences between the two. And then B2C, I think, is becoming more and more of an advertising play, more so than a sponsored play versus just pure co-creation of content. There is a click to buy aspect, right? So um, that allows a little bit different opportunities on that side. So in, in we talked about always on, or I, I guess uh, uh, ongoing, which we like to reference as always on influencer marketing. Um, as you know, there's so many more companies that, that self-identify as being successful. 
um, with an always on, what, what advice can you give to someone who's thinking about influencer marketing and going, well, you know, should I do a pilot? Should I do always on? Should I do one then the other or what, you know, what makes sense? I mean, you always have to start somewhere. So I didn't build influencer marketing overnight into a full blown global program. You have to build it brick by brick. And I say that because if you don't, I think if you don't do it that way, you're going to get up with a lot. And then what is the outcome? I think people are like, oh, let's do this because it's a new thing in marketing. Well, what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Is it awareness? Is it lead gen? Is it demand gen? Is it thought leadership? Is it event uh, attraction to an event for attendance? Like what is your outcome? Start with your outcome, like why you are doing influence market, influencer marketing at all, and then start with something that you can say, okay, this is something that I can do and measure and show impact to the business. Because if you don't and you do a program that does social media awareness and you didn't, you know, you're not clear about what the impact is, then people will say, oh, that was a nice thing, but that's a nice to have. It's not a must have. How do you make it a must have, right? So you build it brick mm -hmm. by brick. You may want to start with a pilot or you may want to start with some kind of programming that has some actual impact to the business or to the marketing campaign that you're working with or on. And then start, you know, cultivating the relationships with the influencers, right? That way. And then pretty soon you're going to start having, okay, we started with this campaign. Now we have these group of influencers that we kind of work with. Here's the real, here's our core influencers who have been really engaged in this process. What's the next thing that we're going to do at our company? What's the next outcome we're looking for? And that's how you start to build your pro program with one campaign and some influencers and start building on the influencer community and start building on the content and other plays that you're going to do with these influencers. And don't forget to bring in your customer advocates and your employee advocates as well, because when you add all of those together, you end up with a much more powerful, um, you know, pull to your marketing materials. That's a good point because influencers aren't just those industry experts. They are customers. They are um, other people in your community or in your universe uh, of industry um, that have points of view and, you know, have impact when, you know, they say something, people listen, right? Um, you know, the customer experience is a big initiative. It's a big uh, focal point for a lot of B2B marketers. And in the context of influencer marketing, I feel like influencer experience is also a big, a big focus or should be a big focus. What I mean by that is, you know, in the, in the realm of this mutual value exchange, you know, yeah, okay, I get promotion uh, in some content from a brand that my audience will respect and it'll make me look good. That's cool. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? Right. And, and I'm just wondering if you have any advice for people on how much they should pay attention to the experience that they pay to creating a good experience for the influencers in the process of, you know, co-creation of content or participating in events or whatever it is that they're doing for your brand. No, I'm so glad you brought that up because a lot of times you know, influencers, when you're working with them, they'll have a great experience with you. And I think that helps not only the relationship, it's how they think about your brand and what you leave them with. You want to treat influencers with respect. Um, you want to make sure they're having a good experience. And that doesn't mean gifts or anything like that. It means when they're co-creating content with you, listen to their feedback, be open to the feedback that they're giving value what they're saying, even if they're not agreeing with you, because there is value in that feedback, especially when they don't agree with you, because you're going to get something of value that you're going to be able to bring back to the business that maybe you didn't know much what people do in analyst relations, right? So mm -hmm. that is a value. So don't forget that. And then people, you know, you brought these people in because of their knowledge and their experience. So don't make them feel like if they say something like that, oh, you know, I can't give advice to SA, you know, you don't want that kind of, you know, relationship or atmosphere. You want it to be a mutual feedback loop, right? And you want to create that. And then when they're with you, you know, what we do, you know, and like I said, I'm like, yes, but when we have influencers that came to our events, when they were in person, we always had a gift bag with some thoughtful stuff that they could have fun with. Something was always branded if they wanted to use it and, you know, whatever, and, it, you know, kind of show it off, that's fine. The other thing is, you know, giving them exposure and the right kind of importance at your events or at, when you're creating content, giving them exposure to the right experts on your side and not yeah. you know, being a bottleneck or, or if they don't understand something, say, hey, would you like to meet with 
the um, technology person or do you want to meet with the other marketing person so they can have a better view because then they'll walk away more informed than not versus just getting some marketing dialogue and then being told like we really want this piece done like this so yeah. if you have that experience but then you have experience where you're really brought in maybe sometimes even to be a beta user or sometimes even to give your feedback on upcoming product all of a sudden that just changes their experience and they're much more involved with you so I think it, that's really important. And it's not, again, about gifts or gift bags. It's more about what access you're offering them and other things like that, that have that kind of intrinsic value. Great. Now, activating influencers to co-create content, uh, obviously we both agree that works really good, uh, really great, really good. <laughs> yeah. But no program is going to get off the ground unless it has budget. Um, I'm curious what recommendations you can share uh, for winning budget to, to do a pilot or, or even a longer term program? So, I mean, budget is always an issue for everyone these days. So I can say that I started with no budget and I had to pitch my other marketing colleagues for pieces of their budget to actually do influencer marketing. Right. And I started a global demand gen team. So what you really have to do is I said, you know, here's the context of what this is and here's the outcomes that you can expect. And of course, a lot of these were just guesstimations because there wasn't anyone else I could look at and say, who's doing demand gen? Who's doing, you know, a, you know, ABM or who's doing kind of co-created content with influencers. And I had a lot of B2C stats that was very helpful, but I had to have a very pointed sort of, here's what we're going to do. Here's what that could look like. A program could be any book, a program could be some sort of event speaking engagement. Uh, and then you get some promotion out of that. Another thing was, you know, here are some, kind of demand gen content that could really work in your campaign. And so you have to have a menu of options and outcomes to show like, here's what the context is. This is why it's important. Here's some of the things I can do for you, right? Business or marketing team. And here's the outcomes that you can expect, right? And when you have that, then people are like, oh, okay, it's not just an idea and we're going to see what happens. I started with that and I wasn't getting anywhere. So I had to be really pragmatic. And once I did that, then people said, okay, this is, okay, I can see that this will have some impact on um, what I'm doing could help me with my marketing campaign. Okay, let's see and let's try it out. And that's how I got a pilot from the CIO group at SAP. And that's where we started with an event and it was an ebook and they both did really well. And we were able to share that with all the other teams. And then my inbox was getting full after that, right? <laughs> because people saw the value because they saw it in action, they experienced it themselves. So you want to be open about your, you know, kind of communicate the outcomes and make it valuable to the person you're talking to. So know who you're talking to, know what they're about, know what they're trying to achieve, know how you can help them have the outcome and then always report back and try to share those results with, you know, the folks, you know, that you can so that they can experience it themselves because once they do, then they just want more and they want to think about it in a different way than just like, Oh, this was an ebook. No, actually let's think about it in a bigger way. And that, then that's how you're going to say, okay, well that was great. And now here's the vision and here's how we can get to this sort of bigger plays with influencer and make it a part of our marketing stack, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. You get some more, you get some tangible data to use to support a strategy, right? Um, and now there's more data out there. To yeah. help. If I had what it, what's out there now, it would have been really helpful um, <laughs> those years ago. So, Yeah. Well, um, in our research, we found for those companies that had those full inboxes after a successful pilot that they're outsourcing uh, some of the work. Um, in fact, what they're outsourcing to, outsourcing to agencies relative to influencer marketing includes things like identifying influencers, um, helping manage those influencer relationships, developing strategy, and of course, measure, measuring uh, effectiveness. I'm curious what you found to be the most useful when it comes to using outside help for an influencer marketing program or effort. So I started in-house first because that's what I had. And then eventually you started working with folks like you. Um, and we share the same philosophies. It's really important you know, identifying influencers, yes, you should get outside help, but there's a list list out there. So, you know, you want to verify those things. And then once it's been identified, you should be part of the relationship development and the relationship. I think when you outsource the relationship, it is very difficult 
to create that ongoing community, to create that always on, you can certainly have the help of an agency to help manage the relationship. But I really feel strongly that the relationship that the influencers want is with the brand yeah. and not with the agency. Now, if the agency is a player in that, that's great and helps. But again, the brand needs to be the end goal, especially for influencers. That's what I hear back from influencers as well. I find yep. that very few agencies have those relationships. You guys have them because you've been around and you understand B2B influencer right. marketing, right? Which can be a big help for people just starting out. But again, the brand needs to have that relationship and then measurement and all of that can be outsourced, right? Or, you know, yeah. brought in house or, but again, it can't just be those, you know, vanity metrics that you want to show. You want to show deeper metrics and you have right. to allow your agency access to that or kind of come up with a grid or what I call a dashboard that shows all the metrics that you've had impact on. Um, yeah. And so allow your agency for success by giving them exposure to those things and then ask like, Hey, what, what works for other companies? What have you seen works? Because this is what my sandbox looks like. So how can I be successful here? I think that outside in perspective for someone who doesn't have the experience would be really helpful. But again, I think the relationship piece should be owned by the brand, um, mm -hmm. especially in B2B, because we're not looking at tens of thousands of influencers. We're looking yeah. at a few, even for a company the size of SAP. Yeah. You know, speaking of measurement, uh, what are some of the measures of success that you've most often find yourself talking about? Um, measures of success that people are asking for uh, within your organization as it, as it relates to influencer marketing? So I think people want to look at not just the social media metrics, right? I think yeah. that's great. I think they wanted to get into views. They want to get into engagement. They want to mm. get into, okay, if you, you know, which influencer led to what, which led to which MQLs, right? So you're mm. all trying to get to MQLs, but then you also take a look and say, were these the right MQLs? Were they the right industry? Were they the right persona? And then you can take a holistic look at your campaign and say, hey, you know, by working with this group of influencers, this is the person that we were able to hit. This is what it led to. And this is the impact it had, right? Some people just stop at MQLs and they don't care about what happens at the sales level. And then that's somebody else's job. I think for us, if you really want to be helpful and have influencer marketing really take off and work for you and get the benefits that you can fully get. You have to see where that actually goes. Go back to your sales team. Is this the right thing? Were these the right MQLs? Are these the logos you're trying to reach, right? Sometimes you can go back to the influencers. Say, hey, we had a great campaign. We loved it. We are really trying to target this industry. What do you think we should do? And sometimes they're like, hey, I'm not the right person, but so-and-so is, or hey, I can do that. Let's think about putting the piece in this way because that's what that industry needs. And by the way, you know, let's find, you know, other customers, you know, bring our customers in that can mm -hmm. bring more of that flavor in. So I think that's what you need to constantly be adjusting and looking at that. But those sure. are the, kind of the metrics that we look at that are deeper. Yeah. I mean, you can show up with the social media metrics and you can show up with the stuff that makes everybody feel good. But I think executives are very, very smart. They have very limited time. They want to know where they're investing their dollars is having an impact on the bottom line. Yeah. Yep. Especially now. Right. Yep. What do you, will you say are some of the top mistakes um, B2B brands are making when it comes to working with influencers? I think when you're the key to the, the success of any program is who you're working with. And so identifying and vetting influencers, I think people <coughs> need to spend the time to do that instead of rushing into something. Yeah. Um, I think oftentimes they'll see brands, you know, they'll see, oh, SCP is working on these influencers. That's going to be my influencer set. Well, no, not, you know, the line of business, the cloud, you know, what I work with now is different than some of the folks that I even worked with with core SAP, right? So you have to think about the business and persona you're targeting and think about which influencers work there. And by the way, they're not all going to be social media influencers. If you only have social media influencers, you're only going to get those shallow results that we talked about. If you mm -hmm. want those deeper results, you have to look at your influencer, you know, as social media influencers, business influencers. If you have developers, developer, you know, kind of break it out right. in that way and see how, what your program is really calling for and what you're trying to influence and who you're trying to influence. But I think that identification is a key part. And I think that's where a lot of people come back and they're like, well, we had this great program and the content was good, but it didn't hit the mark. And I don't know why I didn't get a lot of traffic to my website when I work with these people. They had so many 
followers, right? It's, that's not what it's about in B2B. It's a little bit, it's a little bit different and you need to have the thought leadership there, but it can't just be that shallow number. It's not based on numbers like it is. Right, for right. B2C. This has been great. Uh, let's wrap it up with a, a future prediction. Um, what, uh, what prediction could you make about uh, influencer marketing in the future? I don't know if it's a year or two, three years from now, like what, as far as, especially as it relates to B2B, like, is there something that comes to mind as far as something that you feel will really be different? I think that, you know, people are waking up to influencer marketing, but I think a lot of people think of influencer marketing as external influencers and bringing them into your company. I really think, and I alluded to this before, I think it's about communities of influence overlaid on the shoots and ladders of the customer journey as it is now for B2B and thinking about bringing in customers, employees, you know, the advocates, customer advocates, partner advocates, and others in your industry, associations and the like, along with those external influencers and kind of putting them together to create your own community of influence that it will impact your entire customer journey. I think that's, you know, I've been talking about that for a while. I've been spending a lot of time pulling apart the customer journey. I think that's where when you get to that point, I think that's where you're going to get the maximum benefit and you're going to be creating content and creating relationships with even your customers and conversations that they're not going to get anywhere else. Fantastic. Well, this has been, this has really been good. Uh, I always love talking with you, Amisha, and uh, we have to talk more often <laughs> on camera. It was or a off. pleasure. Yeah, this is great. So how can people find out more about you and, and about the work you're doing? Um, come find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place. Um, okay. I like to share a lot. If I find a great article, I share there um, as well. I love to hear from people. I love to hear what they're doing because I feel like we can all be learning from each other. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.